north of New York City in the beautiful Hudson Valley. And today what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about presidential history, how the presidential library came to be, the kinds of things that we do here, and then we're going to share some of the kind of cool documents that we have in our collection. And then what we'll do is at the end we'll open it up to some questions and answers. You supply the questions, I'll supply the answers. And so let's get started. Um, the concept of presidential libraries actually began with none other than George Washington, our nation's first president. And as we all know, um, there had never been a president of the United States before. And so we spent eight years in the revolution fighting the British, thousands of lives lost, millions of dollars, and now we were our own independent country. And we better make it work. Because if we didn't make it work, the British would be back and we know they would probably hang all the founding fathers and they would subjugate us back into being colonies again. Nobody understood this more than George Washington. And when he was elected to be our first president, he said, we have to make this work. Now, he wasn't so worried about himself because he had been a big shot landowner back in Virginia. He had been head of the Continental Congress. He had been head of um, the Continental Army. And he knew how to get stuff done. But he was afraid that the people who followed him in office might not be you know, um, so easy uh, to pick up the, the job and run with it. So what he decided to do was, he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make all of my papers available to future presidents. That way, the guys that follow me in office can see how I did the job, what I did, how I did it, you know, who I talked to, who I worked with, and they'll get an idea right out of the, right out of the gate on how to do this job. It's kind of like when you guys have got an older brother or sister who maybe has the teacher that you have now. Maybe, um, you know, they had them a couple of years ago. So you ask your brother, hey, Bill, you know, what's, what's Mrs. McGillicuddy like? You know, is she funny? Does she give a lot of tests? You know, is there a lot of homework? And you want to get a sense of what it's going to be like in the class before you get there so you can get prepared. And that's what Washington wants to do for these uh, future presidents. So he packs up all of his charts and graphs and letters and memos and reports and he goes back to Mount Vernon where he wants to organize his papers. <clears throat> but before he has a chance to get all of his, organized, uh, his papers organized, he dies. And in fact, many of George Washington's papers were um, destroyed. Um, how do you think, any ideas how they might have been destroyed? Somebody give me a guess. Burned. By what? Burned. Burned? You mean fire? Yeah. That is the number one wrong answer. So if you have to give a wrong answer, that's the right answer to give, even though it's wrong. They weren't burned. As a matter of fact, many of, uh, Rose, uh, many of uh, Washington's papers ended up looking like this. And it wasn't fire that did it. It was rats. Yeah, George Washington was a fancy guy, and he wrote on fancy paper. And the paper was very, very tasty for rats, so they couldn't help themselves, right? If I wrote you a note on a pizza, do you think you'd read the note, or would you eat the pizza? You'd eat the pizza, I know, I know. So listen, it's not just young historians who are hungry for history, it's rats also. Well. What happened was the concept of the presidential library died along with that. And so from President Washington all the way up to President Roosevelt, we've lost a lot of our presidential history. Sometimes it was placed in wet, damp basements, which are um, you know, not good for condition, good conditions for papers. Sometimes they were placed in hot, dry attics where um, they became uh, dusty and brittle and deteriorated. Sometimes if a presidential signature was on a document, it might just be cut off sold for its autograph value, and the document simply discarded. There's even reports that Robert Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's son, burned a lot of Abraham Lincoln's papers. Yeah, Robert Todd Lincoln became a big shot in the Pullman Railroad Company. And of course, you know, Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin. It was kind of uncool to have a, you know, a parent that was born in a log cabin. You think your parents are embarrassing. Imagine having your parents be born in a log cabin, right? And then all your friends find that out. Mm. So what he did was he tried to destroy a lot of those documents. So along comes Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt says, all right, I just got us through the Great Depression, this major time in American history, and historians are going to want to know how I got through this. 
So I am going to make my papers available to future historians and future presidents so they can see how we got through this. So he phones up the Library of Congress and he says, hey, you guys want my papers? And what happens is uh, the Library of Congress says, well, how many do you have? And he tells them how many he has. And they say, we don't have room for all that. We'll take a couple of these, a few of those, one of those, a couple of them. And Roosevelt says, no, you take everything or you take nothing. So the Library of Congress says, OK, we'll take nothing. Now, how many documents does Franklin Roosevelt have in his presidential library? Well, he happens to have about 17 and a half million pages of documents. Right. Now, put your mind around that, right? How do you do that? Well, let's take a look. You're probably all familiar with the Washington Monument. Right? You all seen this somewhere before, right? In Washington, D.C. If you haven't been there, maybe you've seen pictures of it. Well, if you put all our papers on top of each other, we would have a stack not as tall as one Washington Monument, not as tall as two Washington monuments, but we would have a stack as tall as 16 Washington monuments. Right. That's how many documents we have in our collection. And if you look closely, you might be able to see the Capitol Dome back there. Oh, wait a minute. It's not the Capitol. <laughs> it's me. Never mind. Okay. So the idea here is we've got all kinds of documentation if you're looking for material on the Roosevelts. So where do we put all this stuff? Well, Franklin Roosevelt took a yellow piece of legal pad just like this and he sketched out what he wanted his presidential library to look like and he wanted it to look like this. Down here are his initials, FDR, April 12, 1937. So he wants his library to look like this. It's got a large sloping roof built around a nice porch, six over six windows, 12 over 12 windows, and made of Dutchess County Fieldstone. So he gives this sketch over to an architect who then creates this building. And this is what the presidential library looks like here at Roosevelt time. Um, he's got the large sloping roof. It's got the six over six windows, 12 over 12 windows in the bottom, built around a nice inviting porch, and it's got um, the Dutchess County Fieldstone on the outside. And it's such a beautiful day today here that you can actually hear the birds tweeting if you listen carefully. Spring has arrived in Dutchess County, boys and girls. So, quiet. So that is um, Franklin Roosevelt's presidential library. In this building, uh, 17 and a half million uh, pages of documents, about 53,000 books. 23,000 of those belong to President Roosevelt himself. So how do we store these documents? Well, Franklin Roosevelt also developed the boxes by which he was going to store his documents. And this is an original box. Uh, if you look here, it says Democratic National Committee 1932, Correspondence 1928 to 1933. That's what it says there on the side. And this box was designed by Franklin Roosevelt himself. It would sit on a shelf like this. There's a little piece of uh, like a ribbon here and he could go through, pull the ribbon, the thing would slide off the shelf and he would have it in his lap. Then what he could do is open it up and you notice it makes like a little tray. Really, really important to a guy who's in a wheelchair because if he drops the papers, he won't be able to get them down there. So he's got them here in the tray and he's able to work with these things. And this is what's called a clamshell design. So when you close this down, see what it does? It closes out all the light. Okay, it closes out all the light. And uh, that's really important because one way you can destroy documents is to expose them to light. That's why you're not supposed to take photographs, you know, flash photography in museums because you think, well, it's only just that one little flash. But if that's repeated, you know, thousands of times or millions of times, then what you end up with is a, bit, a blank sheet of paper. It also has the metal reinforced corner. So when he was running around and he was going to bump into things, he wouldn't have to worry about that. So this is how they were originally stored. But now we have modern day Hollinger boxes, and this is what they look like today. They're much bigger, but you'll notice they have some of the same architectural design features that Roosevelt put in with his. Now, instead of a ribbon, we have a string. So you pull the string, it slides off, and uh, you've got this uh, box now, and it's got the clamshell design again, so that when you shut it down, right, all the light gets shut out, and it's got the reinforced corners on the sides. So we have about 22,000 of these in our collection, and I want to show you a picture of what they look like when they are in their natural habitat. So that's what it looks like. Imagine a shelf 
that can hold, you know, 17 and a half million pages of documents from floor to ceiling. That's what these, um, these things are. Now, here's an interesting uh, design flaw with some of these. See these boxes over here? These have got little holes in the, in the hole uh, in the bottom here. And that was so you could put your finger in and slide the box out. But we discovered that that was letting light in. And so that's why we use the, uh, the ones with the string as we need to do. Now, if you want to know more about the presidential library system, you can learn it by looking at this chart. Because this chart shows the presidential library system as it is today. And you can see I'm speaking to you from way over here in Hyde Park, New York. And uh, some of the places you guys are, let's see, uh, you've got uh, the Carter Library kind of close to you in, in North Carolina out there. And Wisconsin, well, let's see, you know, probably closest to you would be Hoover. Not a whole lot of presidents from up in this uh, area up here. But this shows you the presidential library system as it exists today. Now, the way this worked was this. Since Roosevelt was building this library to contain his own papers, he used privately raised money. So it doesn't cost the taxpayer anything to build a presidential library. He took his hat, passed it around, and he said, all right, you know, pony up, give me some money here. And he raised $376,000 to build the presidential library. And then once it was built, it was handed over to the National Archives and Records Administration. And I can prove that because I've got, uh, I've got this right here. This is a, a, a bronze medallion that uh, came off a building when I hit it with a hammer. And um, what this is, I, I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding, that would be destruction of government property. Um, but this is the National Archives. And if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., and you've seen the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the you know um, Declaration of Independence, that is our home office, the headquarters. That's where we uh, have our headquarters, and we're part of the National Archives and Records Administration. And it's not really bronze, it's just made out of styrofoam. But um, there you go, fake news. All right, so what kinds of things do you find in a presidential library? I'm glad you asked. Basically, it comes down to three categories of things. There are documents, there are photographs, and there are objects which in the museum world are called uh, artifacts. So let's take a look at some of the uh, documents you're likely to find in our collection. So the first thing we have in our collection is this. And this is Franklin Roosevelt's birth announcement. Now Franklin Roosevelt does not have a birth certificate because he was not born in a hospital. He was born at home. But what's interesting about this document is it's basically really more of a picture than a document. But look at all the information we can get from this. So we know his name is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So that's his middle name, Delano, which happens to be his mother's maiden name. We know he was born on January 30th, 1882. And we know that he's the son of Mr. and Mrs. James Roosevelt. We also know, if we look closer, that his nickname, FDR, came from the time that he was a little baby. So it wasn't something that he picked up later on, you know, when he was running, you know, for a political office. His father started calling him FDR when he was a little teeny baby, and he wrote it right there on the, uh, the bundle. We also know that he was born in Hyde Park, New York, because his father wrote Hyde Park, New York, up here on the stork. Otherwise, FDR may have been delivered to a different family, and history would have been vastly, vastly different. So, from one document, boys and girls, we can know when Roosevelt was born, what his middle name was, who his parents were, and where he was born. If you can get all that information from one document, imagine what you can get from 17 and a half million pages of documents. Not bad, right? Now, you guys, uh, you're students, right? And so, uh, every now and then, report cards come home, right? And sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing, right? So here's the deal. This is Franklin Roosevelt's report card. And you might think if you are the president of the United States, a four-term president who gets the country through the Great Depression, through the Second World War, um, doesn't let polio stand in your way, and creates the United Nations, that you'd be a straight-A student, right? But look at this. Here's FDR's report card, and it's mostly B's and C's. So if you're not doing so well, let your parents know. Even Franklin Roosevelt only got B's and C's. 
okay? But he worked hard and he tried hard. So this will show you, um, you know, again, what kinds of things you're likely to find? Well, we know what his birth certificate looked like. We know what his report card looked like as well. Here is a poster from when he was running for the state Senate. And there he is with his little glasses on, right? Looking kind of dapper, pretty good. And then one of the most famous documents we have is a document called the Day of Infamy speech. And I want to show you that. I'm going to put this over here and zoom in with our fancy document holder cam. There we are. So let's just go up here a little bit. Okay. So this is what's called the Day of Infamy speech. And this is the speech that President Roosevelt gave before the Congress um, asking for a declaration of war against Japan. Notice it says yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in, and it used to say world history, but then FDR scratched it out and he wrote infamy. So that's when it became the day of infamy speech. Also what's interesting about this, boys and girls, is that it's dated uh, December 7th, but he gives it on December 8th. So he starts off with the word yesterday. Now today we are so, so spoiled with having instant information, right? You know, you go right on your phone, you can see things going on all around the world, but the world was a bigger place back in those days. You'll also see here, there's a carrot, like one of these little marks here, and a dash and a dash. This is stage direction. He, he's giving himself stage direction on how he wants to deliver this speech. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, dramatic pause, dramatic pause, dramatic pause, a date which will live in infamy, dramatic pause, dramatic pause. So that's just a small sample of the kinds of, um, of documents that you're going to find in our collection. We also have photographs. And here is a photograph. And who do you think this might be a photograph of? Any ideas? Anybody want to take a guess? Salem. His wife. His wife. No, his wife was much older than this. It's him. No, not his wife. Uh, our chat box says his sister. His sister? No, he didn't have any sisters. One more guess. It is him. That is Franklin Roosevelt. This is Franklin Roosevelt? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. You're right. This is Franklin Roosevelt. Now, isn't he cute? Right? I haven't seen a baby picture that cute since I was looking at my baby picture the other day. Um, what's interesting about this is this is how fancy people dressed over in Europe during the time period. So Mrs. Roosevelt, his mom, uh, you know, kind of fancied herself being a fancy person. So she wanted to dress Franklin all fancy like they were doing over there in Europe. So until he was about seven years old, she kept him with long hair. And this is called a smock. It looks like a dress, but it's actually a smock. This is how fancy people dressed. And that's how Mrs. Roosevelt, his mom, Sarah, wanted him to dress. Now you can see he's too young to really care because he's kind of smiling, right? But as he gets older, he's able to get his hair cut, but now he's got a dress in a kilt. And you can see there, he's not so happy about that, right? So imagine, you know, your pictures, you know, until you're about seven or eight years old, you know, you're dressed with long hair and a kilt or long hair and basically a dress. Well, if you were fancy people back in the day, that's how it would look. Then he gets to be a little older. Here he is as a teenager, right? Now he's starting to look like a regular guy, you know, fancy, good looking but you know, not wearing dresses and long hair anymore. And then here is a picture of him and his wife. Okay, so there they are. And then here is a picture of him and his wife on their way to being inaugurated, right? To becoming president. And you can see how fancy they are, right? FDR has that top hat I was showing you a second ago. And you know, pretty darn fancy, right? And then here is a picture that most people would recognize as FDR. This is a very um, famous uh, pose of the president. He's got the, the cigarette holder. He's got the you know, smile. It's a profile. And he looks very confident. You know? He's like, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That was his motto. And there he is working his way through that. But now I want to show you a very rare photograph. 
And this is a color photograph of President Roosevelt that was taken in 1944 as part of the re-election campaign for his fourth term. And what happened was Franklin Roosevelt was very sick at that time, and a lot of people thought he might be too sick to be president. So they thought that if they put out a color photo of him, um, it would look better than a black and white photo. And so here is a rare color photo of President Roosevelt taken in 1944. You can see, you know, he's he's worn out, right? I mean, you know, look at the the large, you know, wrinkles and things on his on his face. You know, um, he's very stressed out. But uh, nonetheless, it was a color photo. So documents, photographs, and we also have in our collection objects which are, you know, in museum biz called artifacts. So let me show you some of those. And we'll start off with this. What do you think this might be? Any ideas? Okay. Go ahead, Galileo. What do you think, Galileo? All right, our chat box says a cast. A cast, ooh, I never heard that one before. Um, not a cast, but you're on the right track. I'll give you a hint. It smells like 85-year-old dog spit. <laughs> Go ahead, Salem. Dog toy. dog toy. Yes, exactly. It's a dog toy. This is one of FDR's dog toys. So even the dog toys ended up sometimes in the museum because Fala, his dog, was really important to him. So we've got some artifacts that belong to Fala as well. Now let me show you this. This is a um, model of FDR's wheelchair and we've got two of these in our collections. Now, FDR contracted polio at the age of 39 and was never able to walk unassisted again. And he used a wheelchair to get around. Now, here's the problem. Wheelchairs back in the day looked like this. All right, big giant porch, you know, kind of, you know, furniture almost. And it was hard to get around in this. So Franklin Roosevelt designed his own wheelchair and it's designed out of a kitchen chair that the legs have been cut off of. It's been placed on a metal frame with wheels, big wheel in the front, little wheels in the back. Notice that there's no arms on this. This was so he could get from one spot to the other and then slide off into a more comfortable chair. Now, Roosevelt had a disease called polio and polio was a muscle disease, not a nerve disease. So he couldn't move his legs, but he could feel his legs. And because he wasn't able to move his legs, his, his muscles had atrophied, including his butt muscles. And so when he was sitting on this chair, he was sitting uh, on the hard wooden surface right here, which was really uncomfortable. So we would just use this to get from one spot to the other. Also, you notice on here, uh, President Roosevelt has got a little round object over here on the side. And that is, of all things, um, an, an ashtray because FDR liked to smoke and he was a big time smoker and today he's dead. So keep that in mind. Somebody offers you a butt, don't take it. Okay. So that's another object that we have in our collection. Now let me show you one other. What do you think this is? Any ideas? Go ahead, somebody take a guess. Go ahead, Salem. It's a basket. A basket. No. Somebody else? Uh, someone in our chat said a lampshade or a helmet? A lampshade, no. Helmet, yes, you're absolutely right. This is a World War II Japanese army helmet. Now notice it is made out of a unusual material, which happens to be bamboo. It's got bamboo stripes that go through here and it's held together with basically um, a, a vine or you know, a piece of twine held on the soldier's head with nothing more than a burlap strap that would be tied underneath their chin. 
This is, uh, tells a really important story because you're not going to get much protection out of a bamboo helmet. But the Japanese were so desperate for materials, steel and oil particularly, that they ran out of steel and oil. So they began to make their helmets out of bamboo. Well, they wasn't offering much protection to the troops, so they decided that they needed to get steel from other countries, and that's how they were beginning to take over other countries around the Pacific Rim. There was one country in particular that didn't think it was such a good idea, and that was us. And so we told them, hey, knock that stuff off. And they said, no, you know, you know, go ahead and make us. So we built up this big base out there in uh, a place called Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And that was like a big military base out there. And we were trying to scare the Japanese into behaving. You know how like, like at lunchtime, you're goofing around at the table, right? And then the lunch aide walks by and then all of a sudden, you know, you're all like, you know, cool and everything's like, you know, you're not doing anything wrong, right? Then the lunch aide walks away and you're goofing around again. Well, that's kind of what Pearl Harbor was. Pearl Harbor was kind of like the lunch lady out there in the middle of the ocean trying to keep the Japanese from taking over their neighbors to get steel so they could build helmets out of steel and not out of bamboo. So, if you're interested in learning about presidents, the presidential library system is a great place to look. You can find out through documents, you can find out through objects, you can find out through photographs. And the idea here is that we try to tell the story with what are called primary source documents. Objects, documents, photographs that were created at the time that tell the story so that now, 85 years later, you and I can sit here and talk over a technology that didn't even exist in Roosevelt's time, showing objects and documents that he used to learn about the kinds of things that went on during his, uh, his time frame. So now let's open it up to some, some questions and answers, if you have any. All right, does anyone have some questions? You can use your camera, you can use the chat box. I have a question. I have a question. Okay, okay, we'll take a question from that big kid in the front. Yeah, with the facial hair. Uh, right. What would you consider to be one of the best biographies on Roosevelt? Wow, best biographies on Roosevelt, that's a great question. There really is no like best biography. The problem with Franklin Roosevelt is that he is such a multifaceted person that a lot of books have been written about parts of his life. So I think probably the best uh, answer I could give you would be a, a book called No Ordinary Time, which was written by a woman by the name of Doris Kearns. And it's a very conversational book. It's a big, thick book, but it, it's a quick read. And it's full of facts, it's full of accurate information, and it's very conversational. And I think even you know, students um, you know, in your grade level there um, would be able to, to get through parts of it. And what it does is it tells uh, the overarching story of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And the title comes from a speech that Mrs. Roosevelt gave at the Chicago um, uh, Democratic Convention when Franklin Roosevelt was getting ready to run for a third term. She goes to the convention because nobody had ever run for a third term before. She goes to the convention and she says, you know, George Washington was president for two terms and that was enough for anybody. And that was the tradition that we followed. And under ordinary circumstances, we really shouldn't have a president for a third time. It's time to get some new ideas, some new blood. But that would be in ordinary time. But this is no ordinary time. And then she goes through and she lays out all the reasons why Franklin Roosevelt needs to be nominated for a third term. And in fact, he is, and he's elected to the third term. So I would suggest the book no Ordinary Time by, um, by Doris Kearns. If you want to learn more about Franklin Roosevelt growing up, there is a, a book by, the, um, by uh, Jeff Ward, and it is called Before the Trumpet. So it's kind of Franklin before he gets all fancy and, and, uh, and famous. So those would be the two books I would, I would recommend. All right, I have some questions in the chat box. Okay, Gabriel great. Gabriel has three questions, so I'll give them to you one at a time. Go Did ahead, Cole, you're on the air. Did Roosevelt have siblings? Did Roosevelt have siblings? Great question. He, um, he had a half-brother, and his half-brother's name was Rosie. So Franklin and um, Franklin's mother and father <clears throat> were, um, well, here's the deal. Franklin had a father, right? And his father had a wife 
um, and her name um, uh, uh, was Rebecca. And Rebecca and Franklin's father had a son, uh, named, which they called Rosie. And then Rebecca died. And Franklin's father remarried Sarah Roosevelt. But Sarah Roosevelt was much younger than, than, um, than Franklin's father. In fact, she was 27 years younger than, uh, her, than her husband. So Franklin has a half-brother, Rosie, by um, the first marriage of James and Rebecca. And his older brother was about 27 years older than he was. The, his, uh, his, his mother was the same age as his, as his uh, half-brother. So he was really not more of a brother to Franklin, but more of like a father figure or an uncle figure. So there was a, a Rosie Roosevelt. Yeah, so he had one brother. Gotcha. Other than that, he was an only child. So they asked, when was the United Nations created and how was Franklin Roosevelt involved? <gasps> wow, fantastic question. Here's the thing. Franklin Roosevelt was involved because Franklin Roosevelt understood the importance of a world body to talk about problems. Here's an interesting fact. Franklin Roosevelt was the assistant secretary of the Navy during the First World War. During the First World War, anywhere from 11 to 14 million people were killed. Franklin Roosevelt was the commander in chief, the president of the United States during the Second World War. In the Second World War, 60 million people killed. Franklin Roosevelt also knew about the development of the atomic bomb and he knew if there was ever a third world war, hundreds of millions of people would be killed. One of Roosevelt's heroes was a guy by the name of Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson had the idea of what he called the League of Nations. So nations would get together, and after the First World War, he tried to create the League of Nations. Well, the League of Nations didn't go anywhere. The United States didn't join, and it kind of you know, died out. So Franklin Roosevelt had the idea of a United Nations. But let me show you um, some interesting um, documents that show the development of this. This is a document. It's the joint declaration by um, the United States of America, and then there are 26 nations that signed this. This document was created at the White House in January of 1941. So after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and then uh, Hitler declared war on us, Franklin Roosevelt called up all these nations and said, come to Washington, D.C. Let's start a, uh, a movement against Hitler and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll fight against Hitler. So these nations, these 26 nations came to the White House and they, decided, they signed an agreement saying they were going to fight against the Nazis. And in school, you'll learn about the Axis powers, which were the bad guys during World War II, and the Allied powers, which were the good guys in World War II. Franklin Roosevelt very rarely used the term Allied powers. He used the term United Nations, because these nations were united against Hitler. Okay? Now, that was one thing. So that starts in January. Then, one day, let me see here, where is it? One day, he's at the Tehran Conference on November 30th, 1943, and he's talking to the big three. We're in the middle of World War II, and he starts doodling, and he doodles out what he wants the United Nations to look like. So this is, from 1943, a sketch of how he thinks the United Nations should be set up. There should be um, 40 United Nations, an executive committee, and then the four policemen. So this is 1943, this is 1941. Notice up in the top of this document, there are listed four countries. These are his four policemen. So these will be the four countries that will keep peace in the world after the World War is over. The United States, the United Kingdom, the uh, Soviet Union, and China. And so he says that these four policemen, right, now he lists them over here on this document, this becomes what we know now as the Security Council. And underneath, what's this United Nations job going to be? It should be an ILO, International Labor Organization, a health organization, and a food and agriculture organization. Because Roosevelt believed that if you had a job and you were healthy and you had good food to eat, you were not going to be causing problems. Right? So like just like after school, right? You get home from school and you get home and suddenly somebody ate all the Twinkies. 
right? And you start getting hangry, right? And you start picking on your brother or your sister because you're hungry because you got nothing else to do, right? So now you're in trouble when your mom or dad gets home because what were you doing? Oh, I was hungry and I was, you know, picking on my brother and sister. Yeah, because you had no work to do and because you were, um, you were hungry. So Roosevelt wants to develop this United Nations. Now, what happens is he sets up a conference in San Francisco for the end of April. 1945 but what happens is he dies on april 12th 1945 so it's almost ready to go but he dies before it has a chance to get going and president truman says we're going to continue on with this and they begin in october of 1945 the united nations meets for the first time so in answer to your question, Roosevelt was thinking about the United Nations all along, right from the beginning, but it didn't get created until after his death in October 1945. All right, next question. This one's from Madison Middle, eighth grade. They want to know how many pets did FDR have? How many pets? Well, FDR was a big dog lover and he loved dogs. So he had dogs all through growing up, um, but he generally had them like one at a time. So it wasn't like he had like six or seven dogs at the same time. He also had a horse um, that he liked to um, uh, to ride. Uh, once he got the polio, he wasn't really able to ride the horse anymore because um, he needed his legs to sort of you know hang on to the horse. But his most favorite and his most famous uh, pet was his little dog Falla. And Falla was a Scotch Terrier, and it was very very important. Pets were super important to President Roosevelt because he was under so much pressure and so much uh, burden with first the Great Depression and then the Second World War that he needed somebody that just wanted to you know, have fun with him. And that was his pet, right? Because when you're president, everybody that comes through that door wants something. Right? It's kind of like you know how you feel sometimes. Your parents are on your case, your teachers on your case, your coach is on your case, your brothers on your case. So what do you do? You just go upstairs and you want to snuggle with your cat, or snuggle with your goldfish, or snuggle with your brown recluse spider, whatever you have. I'm not here to judge, okay? But the point being that your pet just wants to be with you, and you just want to be with your pet. Your pet's not hassling you, right? You know, scratch his belly, give him a bone. That's all he wants and you can get some rest and relaxation from that. And that's why pets were so important to Franklin Roosevelt. So one at a time, the most famous one, Fala. All right, this one's from Max, sixth grade. They want to know, were Teddy Roosevelt and FDR related? Yes, they were. Um, and it's interesting that you should ask that because um, actually, let's go to a, a, different, uh, a different part of this whole thing. The uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was Franklin Roosevelt's wife, well, her uncle was Teddy Roosevelt. So you got Teddy Roosevelt, and his niece is Eleanor Roosevelt, and she marries Franklin Roosevelt. So, um, and Franklin Roosevelt had Teddy Roosevelt as his hero, and it was Teddy Roosevelt who walked President and Mrs. Roosevelt down the aisle when they got married on March 17th in 1905. So the anniversary is coming up. It's not too late to get them something. So um, their anniversary is coming up and Franklin Roosevelt married Eleanor Roosevelt in New York on St. Patrick's Day. And Teddy Roosevelt walked Eleanor down the aisle because by then both of her parents were dead and she needed somebody to walk her down the aisle. Now. What's even weirder about this whole thing is that Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt were actually related even before they got married. And the way it works is this. They were fifth cousins once removed, right? So they were cousins, but it's not as creepy as it sounds, okay? Um, if you go back, here's Franklin Roosevelt, here's um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, and if you go back five generations, they share an ancestor. Okay, so you got to go back five generations and you go back to Nicholas Roosevelt, who had these three, um, uh, Jacob Roosevelt and Jonas Roosevelt and Franklin des uh, descended from Jacobus Roosevelt and Eleanor um, descended from um, uh, Jonas uh, Roosevelt. So they were fifth cousins, five generations separating them. Not as weird as like, you know, if you were to marry your own, you know, first cousin, that would be a little bit, um, you know, a little too close. 
All right, we have some more questions from Galileo. They said, we know he had a lot of vetoes. Why and how many? He had a lot of vetoes? Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, I don't know exactly how many vetoes he had. That's a great question. You've stumped me. Um, you know, a veto basically is when, um, you know, the president, uh, the Congress passes a law and the president doesn't want to, um, you know, doesn't want to sign it into, into law. Sometimes they won't do that because they're in favor of what the bill wanted, but they wanted more. So they say, well, unless we get all of it, I'm not going to sign any of it. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was famous for coming up with uh, programs, and he created all kinds of, of programs. In fact, um, there were over 44 programs in the New Deal. And you probably have heard of the New Deal. And if you ask the average person, can you think of some New Deal programs, they might be able to say, well, there's like uh, uh, the CCC, um, uh, ESPN, uh, wait, no, that's not one of them, uh, uh, right? And they run out, right? But there were actually 44 programs of the New Deal, boys and girls. And the thing that tied them all together was what we call the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. So he created all these programs to bring about relief, recovery, and reform. And they were all part of the, of the New Deal. So when he was vetoing bills, it was probably because they weren't doing enough and he didn't want to settle for you know, part of what he wanted, he was going to hold out till he got all of what he wanted. Anything else? We have a couple more. This one is from oh, great. Eastman. She says, what are a few of your favorite items in the library? Ooh, my favorite items in the library. Um, well, I think the, the wheelchair is very cool because, you know, the president used that to get around. We also have in our uh, exhibit um, uh, the president's car. It's a 19, um, I think it's a 1939 Phaeton car, and he's able to drive it even though he doesn't have the use of his legs. It's got hand cranks, so he's able to, to drive the car um, that way. Uh, we also have a, um, a little rabbit's foot, which was his lucky charm. Uh, President Roosevelt was very superstitious and very, um, you know, worried about. He was afraid of the number 13. He would never travel on a 13. Like he's, if he was going to go on a trip, he wouldn't, you know, start the trip or end the trip on a on the 13th. Uh, he would never have 13 people at a dinner party. He always invited one more person, so there would be 14. So I like the fact that he, you know, carried around this rabbit's foot, and it worked, right? Because we beat Hitler. So it must have been pretty lucky. So I would say his wheelchair, his car, uh, and that, that lucky rabbit's foot. Those are, those are pretty cool items that, that he's got there. All right, these are from Galileo. What was his okay. first name and how old was FDR when he died? What was his first name? What was his horse's name? Oh, his horse's name. Oh, okay. His horse's name, uh, he had several horses over the course uh, of time. And he tended to name them, um, you know, fancy names like, you know, Glorious and, um, you know, Buttercup, those kinds of things. Uh, he was 63, year old, 63 years old when he died. Now, to you, that seems pretty old, right? But the older you get, the younger that is. Let me tell you, kids. All right. Ask your grandparents. So he was only 63 years old. Now, that's not very old. And um, he died at 63 for, because he, he wasn't able to do a lot of exercising, right, because he was in a wheelchair. He had the most stressful job in the world, being president of the United States. He smoked way too much. And he ate a lot of stuff that wasn't good for him. Because when you're president and you're fighting Hitler and you're trying to get the nation through a Great Depression and you want a second piece of cake or a second bowl of ice cream, they give it to you. Right? They're not going to say, well, I don't know now, now, now. You know, um, you're kind of spoiled. So he ate a lot of foods that were yummy for him and tasty for him, but not necessarily good for him. And um, didn't exercise, couldn't exercise, smoked, and had a stressful job. So it all took its toll. And at 63 years old, he passed away of a stroke. All right. Salem, did you have a question? No. Anyone else have any other questions? No. All right. Okay. That looks like it. Okay. So we think of Franklin Roosevelt as a great president. And we think of him as a great president because he was elected to four terms. 
and he only served 83 days into his fourth term, then he died. But he ran four national campaigns, was elected to four terms. He got us through first the Great Depression, then the Second World War. He created the United Nations, and he did it all from a wheelchair. The only president ever elected with such a severe physical disability. Now, you could argue that some of his programs, you know, needed to be done different ways and, you know, some of the things he did maybe weren't so, so good, but you can't argue with the fact that he was a great president in the sense of all the things he was able to do, all the things he was able to accomplish, all the things that he left us with, like things like Social Security, um, you know, and all the various New Deal programs uh, and such. So. Um, that's what I say when, he, when I say he was a great president, that's what I mean. I'm not necessarily you know, being political and saying, oh, he did a great job, but he did a great number uh, of things. And if you want to learn more, please visit our website. Uh, you can Google the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library. We have a virtual tour there. And you should always consider yourself to have a bud at the National Archives. That's me. So if you're doing a History Day project and you need uh, primary source documentation from uh, the Roosevelt Presidential Library, you can get your contact inf my contact information through your teacher. I'd be happy to help you with that. And you know, the coolest thing about history is the more you learn about it, the more you realize that everything we've been through, we've been through before. Okay, so you know, I'm not saying, you know, don't be concerned, but try not to worry about how things are going because we've been in tough places before. And if you can be a president of the United States facing a Great Depression, a world war, and doing it um, from a wheelchair because you can't walk and get all that stuff done, the challenges that you're facing, boys and girls, can be overcome too if you just work hard enough, you work smart enough, you don't give up and you look out for other people along the way, helping as many people along the way as you can. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. We really appreciate it. Okay. And thank you everybody for joining us. It was a pleasure. Goodbye, you guys. Go home and read some history. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. And Jeff, I'll see you at two. Okie dokie. All right. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>